and he was armed with the coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head, 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Ninth verse reads, If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. The Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. 22nd verse, if we could fast forward. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and, Eli, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? I want to talk to you uh, tonight with this simple title. This has been on me for weeks. Is there not a cause? Now let's bow our heads. Could we, Heavenly Father God, we love you. We appreciate you. Won't you just pray with me? Would you do that? Would you just start praying to the Lord? And, and Lord, we ask you just to come and be with us. Lord, we ask you right now that you hide me behind the cross. And you, Lord, you let me speak the words that would enlighten your people, that would engage your people. Lord, we need to be engaged tonight. There's some people in here tonight and, and is watching on the live stream, Lord, that needs to be engaged. And they need to understand they have a job to do. They have a call that there is a cause, Lord. Lord, I ask you to be with us for the remainder of this service. Guard us, guide us, protect us. Let us speak only your words, and we'll be very careful to give you the glory and the praise. The church said amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're being seated in the presence of the Lord? The Lord is good. How many believes that? Amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give us a little, bit of, a little bit of history, if I could, to catch us up to where we're at. I believe it's, I believe it's important. <clears throat> to the to the text so we would understand how in the world Israel has gotten themselves in such a mess. We'll find in the in, in these certain days of antiquity we find we discover something. And we discover that the Lord, because of Israel the people's heart, the Lord has given them a king. And the king that the Lord has given to Israel, his name is Saul. And it's, it's, an, it's just an interesting, a, a very interesting time 
of, of where they have, where, where they found themselves. And in this portion of text, it's, it's, very, it's very clear what has taken, taken place. Saul has come to a place in his, in his life and in his reign as king that he has decided that he no longer needs the leading of God. And if, if you were to go back into the 15th uh, chapter of Samuel, you'll find that Samuel comes to Saul. And it was the battle of the, I can't ever say the word, Amalekites. And my tongue gets twisted for whatever reason on that word, I'm sorry. But it's, uh, and, and what God had spoke to, to, to Samuel to tell Saul was simple. He said, Saul, kill everything. Kill it all. Don't leave nothing. And so Saul is given a victory, a great victory. And, and I guess in his moment of pride and arrogance, he just, you know, it's, it's real easy sometimes to forget who gave you the victory. Ain't that something? And I guess in his pride and arrogance, he, he forgot who gave him that victory. And so in this moment of being, just being Saul and being human, he decided, well, I'm going to, I'm going to keep some of the cream of the crop. And, and I'm also going to, I'm not going to kill their king either. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to take some of the, the, the choice cattle and sheep and, and we're going to make an offering to the Lord, you know. And we're letting the people sort of pilgrimage a little and, you know, the spoils of war type thing, you know. And, and they're going to keep a little there. And besides, we've, we've, we've utterly destroyed these people. It's, it's, it's forgetting that God said, kill it all. And he, Saul sort of got engaged and, and he began to do things his own way. Well, Samuel is awoken in the middle of the night. Samuel, for all of you that don't know, he is God's prophet. God spoke to Samuel. Samuel spoke to Saul. God spoke to Samuel and Samuel spoke to Jesse. If a word was spoken, it was spoken through Samuel. Samuel is awakened in the middle of the night and God is saying, I am repenting that I let Saul do anything. I mean, he's upset. And Samuel, you could tell when you read when you read and study this, Samuel really had a soft spot for Saul. You can feel that. And so he is weeping. Samuel's weeping on the behalf of Saul. And the Lord's like, I don't know why you're still crying over this. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. It ain't the same wording, but it's similar. The Lord's like, I'm fed up to hear. How many's ever been fed up to hear? <laughs> Sister Sherry said, amen, brother. He said, I'm done. And so Samuel goes to Saul. He walks into Saul. Well, how you doing, Saul? The Lord has given us a victory, Saul says. He said, what is that bleeding I hear in the distance? What? Oh, oh, we, now I know what you're talking about. I know, I know what the Lord said, but let me explain something to you. We always got a reason, don't we? We always got something to say. We always got our little input. And it, well, let me explain. There ain't no explaining. It, it's thus saith the Lord. How many still believes that? And he said, well, let me explain. Man, they had some good stuff. They had some good cattle. They had some good sheep, and we just brought us a little, 
of the, of the fatted ones, you know, the real good ones, when we figure we'd make a sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel's like, hold tight, Leroy. Let me tell you what God said to me. We're, my point in even telling you all this because Israel didn't just wake up in this predicament. America didn't just wake up in this predicament. Saul was responsible for Israel. All Saul had to do was be obedient to the Lord. If you'll read the 15th chapter, Sister Sherry, the Bible says that Samuel told Saul God was ready to establish his kingdom forever. I've read it. <laughs> and, and but, but Saul, he just could not. He saw the fatted calves. He saw the, the sheep. And, and he liked the nobriety of, of being Saul, the fierce and the mighty. And you know what he did? He took all of this upon himself. And he decided that he knew more than God. He decided that his, his ways, his works were better than God's word. And guess what? Now the prophet's standing in front of him and saying, God has completely divorced you from Israel. Well, that's tough stuff, isn't it? Hey, Amen. Is it all right if I preach this? Sheesh, I just want to bad. 15 and 22 says, and Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now I'm gonna hit you hard with this scripture. But, but have you really considered what this scripture is saying? We take it, we say, obedience is greater than sacrifice. But let me point it at you another direction. Do you realize that Saul thought he was doing God a service? <laughs> Sheesh. We can go somewhere over that. What do you mean? Ladies and gentlemen, you see, we got it like this. Everything's black and white for us. And we say, see, you shouldn't smoke. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. See, you shouldn't drink. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. No, no, Saul was religious. How many is with me? He was making an offering to God. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't out there committing adultery. He wasn't out there in fornication. No, 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 no. He was playing church. How many is with me today? He was playing God. He was playing king. Are you with me? He was thinking that he was above the principles of God. He was abusing grace. He was abusing mercy. He was abusing justification. He was abusing the goodness of God. How many of us is abusing the goodness of God and playing church? Church is over with. There ain't no more play to play. Man, I don't get no more hand claps in here or nothing. And I know that's good preaching. Have you ever thought about it like that? We always just say, obedience is greater than sacrifice, brother. Yeah, that's true. Saul thought he was doing God a service. Some of us fall in this very category in 1522. 1523 says, for rebellion, watch this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Boy, that's strong meat, ain't it? Now watch. Does anybody know what happened in the 16th chapter of Samuel? Samuel is sent to Jesse's house to bring up a boy named David because God said, I've already found my king. Is there not a cause? <laughs> All right. He's already went to David. David's a shepherd boy. 
Samuel says to Jesse, he says, call up your sons. One of them is the king. I don't know which. I'll know it when I see it. So they call up all the boys but one. You've heard the story. You've heard it preached inside and out. Long story short, there's a, there's a real interesting text that we've just read. And David said in the 29th verse of 17, what have I now done? Do you hear that? Let's put it in regular English. What have I done now? The Bible says they called all the boys up but David. Why? Because David had done something to be put off in the woods, tending sheep. You say, well, yeah, that was a job. Yeah, but you know what? When his daddy wanted him to take food over there to the boys, the Bible says he left the sheep with a keeper. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes, you need to get a hold of this because it's pertinent to your growth, but, but you, sometimes the very ones that, that look like the outcast, sounds like the outcast, and it's put over here and everybody's forgotten about, you know, you're a small little group and you're a small little people and you're a small little church, is the very ones that God's going to use to bring his preeminence, his power back to the body of God. Think about it. You, you got you to gotta start considering these things and considering the element of David. David was a king, ladies and gentlemen, but Saul was standing out there on the battlefield looking like a king and listening to Goliath, but the real king was tending to sheep, was pouring oil on them when they had a disease. The real king was bringing food to the army. The real, are you with me, saints of God? Think about it. David, so Samuel says, bring them up. So they brought all of them up but David. Because you know what? What have I done now? He was looked down on. He was ridiculed. His daddy didn't even like him. I don't have a scripture for that. I just know that. By revelation, I feel that. There was an indifference. You know why? He was anointed. I'm here to tell you, if you've got an anointing in your life, it's a good possibility your mom and daddy won't get along with you. It don't give you a right to be rebellious because if God's really got a calling in your life, you'll just humble yourself and take the abuse. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes they won't identify with you. I know what I'm talking about. Sometimes they just won't bear witness with you. You keep praying, you keep seeking. Maybe you wasn't fortunate like me to grow up in a, in a home of people that loved God and people that was hungry for the Lord. If not, you could be the oddball at the family table. You could be the only one that wants to pray over your food. You could be the only one that knows that prayer works if you're sick. Go to the Lord. There, there's always that person in the bunch at a is odd because God is odd on him. There's always that one person. Think about it. Think about it. And so it's just a strange setting. Remember Joseph? Joseph was just different. From the womb, he was seen differently. His boys was dreaming, his brothers was dreaming up perversions, sleeping with their dads on mistresses. Are you with me? But, but Joseph was dreaming about the sun and the stars and the moon bowing to it. He was, he, was, he, was, he was dreaming stuff that made him look like a redeemer, made him look like a God, made him look like a savior, made him look like something more than what he was. There's always that one in the crowd that's just special. Well, David didn't look special when he come home smelling like sheep. But Samuel inspected all the other boys and the Holy Ghost didn't fall on none of them. The Spirit didn't fall on any of them. As a matter of fact, he got mad because he felt like they wasted his time. For the Bible says that Samuel said, is this all you've got? You know, the Bible says he was a prophet that not one word ever fell to the ground. Whatever he prophesied happened 100%. You don't waste that kind of man's time. He felt like his time been wasted. You mean, do you think you can get over on me, Samuel? I'm the man of God. He's sort of like the angel that, said in the, that stood in the presence of the Lord that, that talked to Zechariah about John soon to be born. He says, how in the world could you doubt the angel that stands in the presence of God? Are you with me, saying Samuel was the one that was living in the temple with Eli when God was calling out his name. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. He's the one as a little boy was given to, to Eli and the high priest, and God raised him from a 
little bitty boy. Ladies and gentlemen, he had the heart of God, the ear of God, the mouth of God. You don't waste this kind of man's time. He's mad. He says, you ain't got no more? Oh, we got one more, but, but he ain't nothing. You feel that. You know, some of you are going to say, well, brother, you're adding to the Bible. How do you know what I'm doing? Why didn't they get him? Explain that part. Why didn't they bring him up? Explain that part. Well, the sheep was important. You mean to tell me a few sheep was more important than the prophet of God? Ah, oh, come back next week when you've thought through that. What have I done now? So the Bible says that Samuel, he said, send for the lad, for we will not sit until he gets here. You can feel that. He's aggravated. You sap suckers, I'm come to get the king of Israel. The Lord said he's in this house, and y'all didn't even bring all of them up. Sheesh. Well, when David gets there, the Bible says he approaches David, and the Lord says, he's the man. He's my king. What has he done now? <laughs> Everybody's like, what has he done now? Oh, look at him, the special one. Ain't that how they act? Oh, look at him, that's exactly what it is. The special one. Oh, he's the, oh, he's the one that's got all those heroic stories. He's the one that sees all those swelling dreams. He come out of the womb playing music. Are you with me? Writes poems, beautiful literature. Every woman in the, in the country, they just fall over themselves looking at him. How many is with me today? He's just special. He's sun-kissed and wonderful. Oh, just look at him. You know what? They eat up with a devil. How many is with me today? Yeah, I know it ain't, I know it ain't modern talk to say it. They're eat up with the devil. Jeal what did we just read? He said, it's witchcraft is what Samuel just told Saul. The, 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 the nation at the moment, because of the leadership, Saul, I'm giving you some history, because of the leadership of Saul had gotten so out of disobedience and so out of covenant with God, it had brought on the principality of witchcraft and rebellion to the point that they hated God's king. Oh, somebody give him some praise. His own daddy hated him. And so, you know what the Bible says? The Lord said, this is the one. He pours that oil on him, and the Bible says, and the Spirit never left him. Never left him. Everybody say, never left. Some of us think he's been a bad, bad boy, but the power never left. The grace never left. The mercy never departed. God never left. You know why? Because when God gives you something, he don't take it back. It don't matter what you do. If God sincerely gives you something, he's not an Indian giver. He does not take it back. He's the same yesterday, day, and forevermore. Amen. All right, David's the king. David goes right back to tending sheep. There's one thing you can find about leadership, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, they have their moments of arrogance and ignorance. But there is not much that will change a leader's personality. Because it's built in his personality just to do and be whoever he is. When someone's anointed of the Lord, you know what? Watch this. If anybody else would have been anointed by Samuel to be the king and he was not actually called to be the king, he'd have wanted to walk right up into Saul's palace right there and say, I'm the king. But David don't do that. You know why, ladies, we could take a, we could take a strong lesson in this is because, you know what, when, when God anoints somebody and someone's anointed for something, that person automatically understood, stands, that there's a growth to this process. How many is with me today? See, some of us, we want to go from zero to hero overnight. And when it don't happen overnight, we get discouraged, complacent, and before long, we right back in sin. How many is with me today? But you know what? The Lord's looking for character. 
The Lord's looking for integrity. He's wanting to see you got the stickability. How many knows what I'm talking about? And he might have anointed you. He might have given you something good. But you know what he said? Stick it out. When nobody praises you, stick it out. When nobody gives you a silver star, stick it out. When nobody pats you on the back, stick it out. When you don't get to sing, stick it out. When you don't get to preach, stick it out. When you don't get to do, why? Because God is building you and one day you'll stand and you'll be able to proclaim whatever's in your heart because God has built you. He went right back to tending sheep. You know why? Because that's, that's what kings do. How I many believes Jesus was a king? He said, let the greatest among you be servant of all. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus real quick. If they had been toilets in Jesus' day, he would have cleaned some of them. How many is with me? If they'd have been toilets in his day, he would have cleaned some of them. Are you with me? As a matter of fact, if you follow Jesus, all you ever realize is the heroic things. But you realize there was, there was uh, three years, basically, of his ministry that we, that we sure enough know of. But you know what? If you follow it uh, symbolically, you'll find out that he didn't have a following until the last year. So the, gr <laughs> the greatest power in the earth went two years without anybody even taking notice. How many is with me today, saints of God? Uh, what do you mean, Brother McKinney? I mean, ladies and he could have created a following. He could have spoke a following into existence. But he said, let the greatest among you be servant of all. We found him washing their feet, not them washing his feet. We saw him multiplying the bread, not telling them. We saw him saying, go get the coin out the fish's mouth. Ah, somebody say amen. God builds character one day at a time. Sheesh. David went right back to tending sheep. And so his dad calls David out. And his dad says, David, he says, leave the sheep with a, a keeper. He said, I want you to take your brothers some bread and some cheese. He said, make sure you feed the captain of the army. So David's excited. He loads up the wagon and he runs into battle with his the Bible says when he gets there is about the time that Goliath was making his appearance. Goliath, two times a day for 40 days, would come out to the forefront of the battle and he would taunt them, antagonize them, because he knew they were scared to death of him. And so about the time that the battle is beginning to array, then David pulls up and the Bible says he leaves his, his food with the keeper of the wagon and he runs into battle and he salutes his brethren, and then Goliath comes out. And Goliath begins to torment them with his speech. And Goliath begins to challenge them the same way that you heard me read. And basically he's saying, look here, if there is a man, if there actually is a man with a backbone in Israel, then he'll come out here and he'll fight me. And if he's got anything, or let me go a little further, if his God is real, How many is with me? Oh, um, fellas, I'm about to preach this. Y'all better hold, hold, hold on. Sheesh, I see this. So he's like, if, if what, what he's doing, he's, he's actually throwing, putting curses on Israel. He, he's actually become now a, a, a the, the, the torment of the devil, whatever you want to consider, the evil one, I don't care, call him whatever you want to call him. He's literally cursing Israel. And the Bible says, now think about this. There's about 600,000 men that drew a sword. You mean to tell me out of 600,000, they wasn't one just absolutely brilliant warrior? Have you thought about that? You mean to tell me, I mean, they wasn't no one warrior in 600,000 people. I mean, the Philistines had a giant. Don't you think Israel had a giant? A nine-foot monster, his, his, his breastplate and all, 150 pounds. And he had a shield man, a smaller guy like me, that went out in front of him, sort of guarding his legs, his undercarriage. He was a rascal. But out of 600,000 warriors, I'm talking about 
brilliant warriors of Israel. You mean to tell me they wasn't one that couldn't match this Goliath? Saints of God, let me tell you something. There was more than one that could have done it. But when the leadership gets out of under the covering and the covenant of God, it opens up a channel of, of spirits, of tormenting spirits, and spirits that de de deplete your confidence and deplete your authority and deplete your power and you're open to curses and principalities and you know what? You shrivel in a corner, scared, slammed to death. Ladies and gentlemen, if leadership would have still been on fire with God, there ain't no way they'd have ever been backed up one day. Not anyway. No, ladies and gentlemen, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue. Saul is backed up. The king of the superpower of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the man that had authority, had a, had a man that heard from God, Samuel, that spoke to him personally about what God said do and not do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This person was shaking in his tent. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to prove to you what I just said is facts because you don't believe it. So David steps out. And David's, he's looking at his brothers and cousins and uncles, and he's like, what's going on? Have y'all bumped y'all's head? He said, this is the most insane thing I've ever seen in my, now listen to what he says. They hear him talking to some others, his brothers do, and his brothers get mad because he is speaking out of arrogance, out of confidence, and out of authority. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, he wasn't under the principality of Saul. He said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? You know what? Let me break that down for you. He said, are you telling me you don't think God can kill this joker? Are you telling me this man's bigger than Jehovah God? Are you telling me you've lost your conviction? Are you telling me you've lost your trust? Are you telling me you've lost sight of who God is? What are is it there a cause? Get a cause in you. Get a cause in you. There's a cause. God wants this man dead. Now you need to get a cause. Where are we at today? Think about this, saints. Think about this. You must admit to yourself. God, you better admit to yourself. The church world is in the toilet. Amen? There ain't no doubt about it. But 70 years ago, she wasn't. 70 years ago, the pulpits predicted who would be the next senator and congressman and governor and president. Because you know why? Because there was men that stood behind pulpits that looked at full congregations. Can I say that again? Full congregations that came to church at least three times a week. Can I say that again? That came to church at least three times a week. That had revivals that sometimes lasted seven continual nights. How many is with me today? that had prayer meetings, that had ladies that prayed at home and fathers that prayed around the table and prayed at home. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, when these men of God, when they got up and preached what we consider hard messages, the congregation was on their feet applauding and saluting him because they realized this was a man preaching from the word of God and they knew that that's what it took to hold them at the place that they were in, but not today. You're fortunate if you get people on a Sunday morning to listen to you singing and preaching an hour and 15 minutes. Sunday night is excluded. We really don't want to show up Wednesday night prayers. We really just want to come Sunday to appease our I mean is with me. We're under a principality of religion. Somehow we're drunk to the place that we think that is enough. 
but yet our families are becoming homosexuals. Are you with me? Transgenders, all kind of protesters, entitlement issues, safe space problems. Are you with me? But yet we think we're fine. No, 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 no. We're under a principality. Our authority's gone and we're shunned, scared, slammed to death of the Goliath in front of us. But I'm here to tell you, there's a remnant. There's a small little corporate body that is screaming, there is a cause. There is a cause. There is an anointing. There is a power. There is an ability to serve God and live in this life. There is a cause. Think about it, saints. Somebody says, well, Brother Jonathan, Brother John, that's just, that won't work today. Well, you know why? It may not work with the masses, but it works with God. And the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, we may be the minority, but in God's eyes, with his authority and his power, we're the majority. Oh, think about it. David had been over there tending sheep, playing his harp. He'd stayed in tune with God. He was an under the oppression, the spiritual rebellion of witchcraft that had now encompassed the, almost the whole nation of Israel. Had got into the government. Saul was so tormented by spirits that he couldn't even have peace to sleep at night. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think about something. When, when, when we have news breaking, it's barely breaking, but it is breaking that our leadership in this government has been having relations with little children. Are you with me today, saints of God? When they've been in blood sacrifice and children's sacrifice, and, and, and they've had not one, not two, not, not a little indiscretion here and there, but, but there actually are career pedophiles. The leadership of this nation. And you mean to tell me there's not a principality over America that is evil, that is wicked, that is anti-God? And do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that most of the preachers behind the pulpits of America are half-breed politicians? Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? That lets you know something. They're going with the flow. I say half-breed, I don't mean race. I mean spiritually. They're half-politician and half-so-called preacher. Are you with me today? How many has God called, Brother McKinney? I don't know. I can't. You know, it's hard for me to put a, a token on, a, on another man's servant. But I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I know if, they're, if they hired out to God, if they're an employer of Jesus Christ, he's about to fire some and put them on the shelf. Because God is looking for people that will line up to his word, preach it no matter who it hurts, and say, this thing has to stop. This thing has to stop. There is a call. I want to challenge the men and the women. Is there a cause? Is your family enough cause? Is your son enough cause? Is your daughter enough cause? Is your wife enough cause? Is your grandchildren that you'll soon have? Is that enough of a cause? A cause for what, Brother McKinney? A cause for you to get conviction. A cause for you to get a prayer life. A cause for you to fast or to push the plate back. Get away from TV for, for, for a minute and just get back and get secluded. Go to a fish bank with your son or daughter and talk about the goodness of God as you reel in fish. Go on a horseback ride and just talk to them about God's blessing. Get away from life. Get away from all this Hollywood and all this pedophile junk, homosexual junk. Get away from it all. Unplug from this world and tell your children, children, there is a call. There's a God in heaven who's looking down. There's a God in heaven who's going to judge the good, the bad, and the ugly. Guess what? I'm going to be judged right there with the evil person. But you know what? I have a hope in me, and the hope says that I saw a cause. Are you ready? The hope says I saw a cause. The hope says that I saw God high and lifted up, and I surrendered my heart to him, and I said, God, I don't want to die on the wrong side of Jordan, but I want to enter your beautiful presence. God, I want to be with you on that great day. You know what he said? said, Jonathan, you better find a cause. Oh. There's a principality over America. The principality is so strong and it's so religious. It's so religious. I'm going to say that one more time for three times a charm. It's very religious. How do you know it's religious? 
Because there'll be people sitting in here and people watching online that will find fault with 90% of what I said because their preacher don't preach it the same way. Even though it's in the book, it's religious. When the Bible says obedience is greater than sacrifice, you listen, you religious person. Obedience to the word of God is greater than sacrifice. You sit on your pew, you sit on your stool and you sit at home and you have your television evangelist and you feel like everything's good as long as you pay tithes and, and give offering and say a few Hail Marys. Let me give you a news flash, brother or sister. Number one, if you've not repented of your sins, and sin, yes, is still sin. If you've not repented of your sin, if you've not, if you've not, if, if every day ain't a sacrifice for you, if there ain't a cross strapped to your back, you're not going there. Amen. You're sitting there and you think you're fine. But let me tell you something. If there's not a cross strapped to your back, and although it's uncomfortable through life, although you're ridiculed for having this big old crazy thing on your back, when you sit down, you feel it. When you stand up, you feel it. If it was just a temporary situation, you would dispose of it. But ladies and gentlemen, this cross is what's going to get you through the pearly gates. So it's not a temporary situation. It's a lifetime fixation. Because as soon as we get sold out to God, we don't mind carrying a cross. You say, well, brother, it hurts. It wouldn't hurt if you was dead. Somebody say amen. Reason it hurts to prune is because we're not dead. Ain't we supposed to be dead? Right. We're supposed to be dead to sin, are we not? So the reason why good preaching hurts is because there's part of our flesh still alive. I'm going to tell you, you got to look in the mirror and say, brother, there's a cause for me to live right. There's a cause for me to do right. There's a cause for me to address my family. There's a cause. I know there's a cause. This one phrase got David an audience with the king of, of, of Israel. Is there not a cause? And Saul says, what are you talking out there, son? And David just begins to go down a litany of things that has been happening in his life. He says, well, you see, I'm just a simple shepherd boy. I tend sheep over there. The Bible never says that David said, well, Saul, I'm the real king anyways. Nope. David had an opportunity to kill Saul. But you know what? Again, maturity speaks. I won't even touch one that was anointed of God. Oh, boy, I could preach on that a minute. Shish. They so quick to lay their hands on God's anointed. They so quick to talk about them. They so quick to run them down. I'm talking about some of you laity. They, they just wear y'all out. They don't know who they touching. But he says, well, well, let me tell you, King Saul, he says, I'm tending sheep over there for my daddy over, you know, over Bethel. Saul said, yeah, I know where that's at. He said, I'm tending sheep over there. I got a little river runs through there. And he says, you know what? I'm sitting under a shade tree and I write music, Saul. I'm just singing a new chorus God gave me under a shade tree, enjoying the Lord's creation. He said, and the bear comes out to get one of my sheep. I just grab him and I pull him apart. I just slay him with my hands. He said, shoot, just the other day, I'm doing about, like, I just woke up from a nap, and I see a lion creeping in. He said, I do the same thing. I just, it ain't nothing to me. He said, I just use whatever I got in my hand. Ain't that what Moses did? He just used what he had in his hand. We, we, we got to get perspective on who we are. Brother Jeff, when we get perspective of who we are, it won't matter if we got little or much. It won't matter if we have super strength or not. It don't matter if we have weapons or not. It, mm, 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 mm. it won't matter because it, it, we know 
It ain't in me. It's in him. And he says, whatever I had, I just went ahead and took care of the lion. And, and Saul's amused. He's, he's like, my, my, my. He's thinking to himself. He said, well, here. That's a big guy you're going out against. Let me give you some armor. And David's like, no. He said, you know, I, I really don't need it. I ain't proved it. You hear that? I just ain't proved it. I've not been tested yet. Uh -uh. You know, you know, he was still doubts in David that he could even be that king. It ain't been proven. It ain't been tested. That's a whole other message. He says, no, I'll just go out there like before. So the Bible says he's walking up through there. Goliath is coming out. And I want you to watch this. Bring me one of those chairs, if you would, right over here. This, this is interesting. Real quick, can I, can I take five more minutes? I got yes, lay right here. Thank you. And so David's picking up a few smooth songs, what the Bible says, five of them, isn't that right? He's picking them up, and he's, he's walking right on up there to Goliath. And Goliath, <laughs> you know the reason why I know Israel had giants? Because David wasn't a midget. And Goliath thought it was crazy that they sent David out. How many is with me? Are you, are you, does that make sense to anybody but me? Why y'all send this little guy here? He wasn't no midget. He was normal size. He wasn't 10 year old. He was normal size man. He probably was underdeveloped. He probably wasn't developed like some of the soldiers. Now David's like, you know what the Bible says Goliath does? He sat down. And goes to chuckling. He goes to laughing. I'm going to tell you what the Lord spoke to me today. The enemy. Are you hearing me? The enemy is underestimating us. I'm telling you. Matter of fact. The enemy. Is underestimating you as much as you are yourself. How many is with me? Goliath sets down and is having a laugh. Now, I'm going to tell you what Josephus, the historian, said. Josephus said that he hadn't put his helmet down, and he had, a, he had what you would sort of like a Roman-style helmet, and he said it, that it had a guard that covered his forehead area. He said he's so relaxed and chilling and laughing, he's got his helmet set back on his head. So he's laid back just... Josephus was a historian, you know, biblical days. And so he's writing accounts of all this, but nonetheless. So he's just chilling. He's laughing. Because who is this little fruit loop? And he ain't even got a weapon. Not a spear, not a shield, not a sword. All I see is a rope in his hand, a sling. So you know what? He's laughing. He's bawling. He's got the entire army of Israel backed up against the walls screaming for mama. So finally, he gets up and he starts approaching David, chuckling, laughing. The Bible says David just takes off towards him. And he starts slinging that sling. And just like before. See, it, it don't take nothing new. You ain't got to go learn karate. Just use what you've been given. Again, this is a spiritual war. He takes that sling and slings it. He's got that helmet up on his head, according to Josephus. It made access for that rock to go right there between his running lights. Lays him down on his back. And David just keeps right on running. He don't stop to rejoice. He ain't about to make the same mistake Saul does. No, he reaches on for the sword. See, some of us, the reason why Goliath keeps coming back is we play with him and 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 we play with him. You got to get in your life and you got to cut his head off. You got to nip it in the bud. You got to nip pornography in the bud. 
You got a nip addiction in the bud. You got a you got to cut Satan's head off. And you don't need no new tools. You don't need no four-step program to be a better you. Use what you've been given. And the word of God is what you've been given. The word of God is what's abiding in you. The spirit of God is what is alive in you. Don't need no new thing. Just use what God gives. Come on, somebody. Oh, no, we get to struggling today in the modern Christian. We get to struggling today, and we go to looking for four-step programs and nine-step programs. If we get too long, we can't do them. Ain't that right? When all the Word says, do you think there was any worse person than Peter? I've done some study on him, Peter. I follow historians. Talks about Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, he wasn't no cool guy. Paul wasn't no good guy. Andrew wasn't no good guy. But you know what, to everyone of them, God didn't say, well, I tell you what, you boys are a little rough, a little rough, a little rougher than I'm accustomed to. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm going to write up a new little system for y'all. And, and you know, you may use it one day in this. I'm going to you know, and we're going to, you know, we'll experiment with. If this don't work, I'll give you another little system. If that is system, I'll give you another little system. And if that system don't work, then I just don't know. I, you know, maybe we have to just wait a little while and come back to it. You know, you know what, ladies and gentlemen? He says, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. There ain't no system about it. It's just an email. Jesus, please forgive this old boy. And look, and then repent. Get up, turn, and go the other way. And run from your decision. Run from your dirtiness. Run from the evil person. Run at a broad run. You don't need nothing new. Just use what God gave you. Oh, I know millennials, they all want a process. They all want a system. And they say it's because they're structured and they're more proper. No, they're lazy. And they're not committed. And they have the spirit of rebellion on them. The reason why I have the spirit of rebellion on them is because of the principalities over America. And the reason why our youth is rebellious is because mama and daddy has not taken authority of the house. Somebody say amen. As soon as mama and daddy takes authority of the home, then I'm here, my, that, little, that little sissy, she may get rebellious, but I'm here to tell you, God will tan her hide every day of her life. She won't be able to breathe one minute without God knocking her around. You know why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, God honors faithfulness. God honors righteousness. God honors goodness. And if you just stick with God, no matter what's happening around you, your Goliath will fall. Because there is a cause. There is a cause. How many believes there's a cause? The devil has underestimated the body of Christ. The people that really know I need the intimacy with God to make it. The people that are screaming, I need to hear something sing with passion and with anointing. I need a preacher to preach at me. I need somebody to shake my hand and hug my neck and tell me everything's going to be all right. I need the body of Christ. That is who's suffering. And you know what? These people are getting to the place that they're going to walk up into the army of this world and they're going to say, who has the cause? I've got a call. And you know what we're going to get? We're going to get ridiculed. We're going to get blasphemed. We're going to get smoked. We're going to get kicked. We're going to get laughed at, scorned. But it ain't going to change God's purpose. God's going to say, don't worry about them. Just cut the racket out. Just like with Pharaoh and Moses, I will certainly be with you. <laughs> How many knows he'll certainly be with us? Shh. Let's stand to our feet, can we? How many loves the Lord? I've preached my heart out to you tonight, and I want you to know something. You're some of the best folks in the world. I believe that you really see a cause. I believe you know that we have a cause, a reason. We're not an experiment, Brother Jeff. We're not an experiment. 
The church of the living God has been tried and true for thousands of years. We're not hopefully going to make it. According to the book, we're the only thing that's going to make it. You just use what God's give you. Young preachers, you preach what's in the book. Don't worry about finding nothing extra. There's plenty in there that ain't getting took care of. You just preach what's in the book. Let God do the rest. He'll multiply what needs to be multiplied, won't he? Amen. So, but, but you just proclaim there's a cause. There's a cause. There's a cause. The devil needs to know there's still a people with conviction. There's still a people that loves truth. There's still a people that feels terrible when we fall. There's still a people that's heartbroken when we mess up. You know why? I want you to, th I want you to think on these things. The reason why you're so heartbroken when you stumble, I'm going to tell you why. Maybe you've never looked at it like this, or maybe you have. Most people, ladies and gentlemen, doing their best not to go to hell. If they sin, they're like, oh, man, I got I to gotta get this right, you know but we look at it in a, in a relational state. And for instance, all of you men and women that's married, you know, you and your spouse, you have fights every now and then. Am I the only one that my wife beats up on? So y'all have fights every now and then. And you don't know why this is, and you wish it wasn't like this. But it is. Y'all fight... And if y'all don't make up pretty soon, y'all all messed up over it, ain't you? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, man, I wish she would say something. And she's like, for first, she's like, he better not say nothing. But then, as it drags on, she's like, if you don't say nothing, she's going to be like, hmm, you still mad? How many knows what I'm talking about? And if you're the man, and if you know you're the one done wrong, I don't care what you say, no matter how big a deadbeat you really are, if you're the one that done wrong, you're hurt. You're hurt. You're hurt. Are you not? You know what? You're not worried about her leaving you. It ain't like that. You're hurt that you hurt her. And the revelation that's coming to the body of Christ is this. The reason why the church will eventually quit sinning is because they will want to quit hurting God. It's a relational thing. When it becomes relational, it's no longer law. Are you with me? When it, are you with, when it becomes relational, it's no longer law. I do this because I'm tired of hurting his feelings. And the reason why some of us can't see that is because we just can't see God having feelings. But eventually, eventually we'll humanize God enough to where we realize he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He can be moved. Are you with me? And so eventually, then it becomes a relationship. See, the bride cannot be the bride without wanting to go beyond the wedding chamber. And you can, if you're always looking at God from a gender base, you can never get intimate with him because there's something in our nature that will not allow us to do that because we're thinking sexual when God's thinking intimacy. There's a difference in lust and intimacy. Are you with me? And so eventually the church will, did you talk about perfection? When the church gets to the place, so you and your wife in harmony, you're perfect. You're a perfect union. There's nothing that can hinder you. You're a perfect union. And as soon as we get the same emotional connection concerning our Lord, we'll walk in perfection because I will not do anything to hurt his heart. How many is with me? See, there's a cause for this gospel. There's a cause. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the more we give of ourselves, the more we give of ourselves, the more we become intimate with the Lord. And intimacy produces conception. We must have intimacy with the Lord. Is there not a cause? Is there not a time to take a stand? 
Is there not a truth worth living for and also at times worth dying for? Where is America's conviction? Amen.